you don't want to appear on the recording, maybe you can switch a video off or um, if that helps. Thank you. So we are recording, Donald. Yeah. That's great. OK, so we're also have with us um, Bob Donald, um, Professor Donald Gray, Amy Kramp, uh, Professor Laura Colucci Gray and uh, Jonathan Hancock. And I'm going to speak a bit more about them in my. I think in two slides time, let me just move this on. So we're hoping to. Um, run this session for 60 minutes. We like to keep to time, so don't think we'll keep you longer than 60 minutes. Um, it, our sessions are packed full of information and amazing uh, guest speakers, so you can only imagine that all of all that they know um, put into 60 minutes isn't easy. We're going to have a, a Q&A session as well. And like I said, the recording, we will be recording the session and then sharing it immediately after or as soon as we can with everyone that's registered on the on the and signed up for tonight. And as you already know, if you've been to our previous sessions, there's further um, evenings that we've organized for you to see the see this uh, cycle of growing all the way through. So you can register for the future ones already because they are on Eventbrite. We will be possibly moving them to another platform, ticket platform soon. But if that happens, if and when that happens, I will let you know. So you won't miss a thing. And I would just love to speak a bit more about my guest speakers tonight. I'm always very proud to uh, introduce the very special people that are going to be showing you how to uh, build your garden. So Donald Gray um, is a professor at the School of Education at, at uh, Aberdeen University, but his particular interest is in science and sustainability issues, and he's been working with uh, One Seed Forward on the idea of garden schools. Bob Donald is the chair and founder of One Seed Forward, so him and um, Donald have been working really um, hard in the northeast of Scotland and elsewhere on this idea. Bob um, Donald founded One Seed Forward in 2017. Amy Kramp, she's a teacher of home economics and uh, at um, Grace Bond High School in Edinburgh City. Welcome, Amy. Laura Colucci Gray, senior lecturer in science and sustainability at University of Aberdeen. And Jonathan Hancock, welcome to you as well, research assistant at University of Edinburgh. And that's all for me magically, so I'll stop sharing and I'll pass on to my next speaker. I think that's you, Bob. It is, yes. I'm just um, getting set up with Windows. OK, so hopefully uh, you should be able to see a screen there saying cultivating, cultivating education webinar. Thank you, Natalia, for the confirmation. Um, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really pleased uh, to be uh, sort of talking to you again about our uh, garden school programme. Um, this month, we're going to be looking at um, the process of planting and growing and what um, the impact of that is as far as the opportunity for learning in your schools. Um, you'll see um, there is a QR code um, on screen. Uh, you don't have to rush to um, download that at the moment. Um, as Natalia said, we will be sending out um, a copy of the um, uh, recording to you, uh, but that will take you directly to our module on our uh, website of OSF Garden Schools, and so we can get um, more information from what we're talking about and access to more resources. But anyway, let's have a little chat about um, planting and growing. So last month we we uh, talked about seeds and germination. And planting and growing is really the next step in the process of bringing a seed from its to maturity. So some seeds are planted directly into the ground, whilst others are germinated on heated um, heated uh, sort of uh, trays or windowsills, particularly this time of year. Now, as we know, it's a little bit early in Scotland, maybe to be planting directly into the ground. There's still a wee bit of frost, to say the least. Um, but um, we can certainly look at the germination process. And uh, I'm really thinking about that. So again, that's so we're starting the seed germination process now. Then really we could run the first step towards uh, the planting. So what we're going to do today is we're going to sort of um, have a little talk about 
um, various things that are related into the planting and growing process. So you'll see on screen that we'll have a chat about root systems. We're going to be comparing the space above and below the ground as far as plants are concerned. Um, we're going to have a chat about water and um, the impact that water has on the development of um, seeds and plants. We're also going to look at some uh, practical processes for you in your schools about planting in different spaces and some concepts such as uh, square foot gardening and companion planting. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about plant care routes as well. So I suppose at this stage, um, I, I guess the question is, what is planting? Yeah. So planting involves the active process of uh, placing a little seedling into the ground or, or sowing a seed directly into the ground. Um, when we're doing this planting, we can actually look at some of the um, items that we've discussed earlier in the process. And um, so we can revisit topics such as um, soil and seed germination. So we can get the pupils again looking at it from a practical perspective rather than um, a, a theoretical one that we may have done before. Um, central con considerations in the planting process are, as we've said already, looking at the physical space above the ground or under the ground, about watering, the importance of watering, about the importance of access to light, and also the competition for nutrients. And so, sorry, Bob. Do, uh, the slide hasn't moved on in mine. Have you moved the slide on? Yes, it's on main topics. All ah, right, okay, that's main topics. It's still the same one. Yeah, I thought you'd gone on to the next slide. That's okay. Carry on. Sorry to interrupt. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, um, so uh, basically what we we're talking about is really about the process of planting and that we want to ensure that every plant has got enough nourishment. So what we want to do is really look at each of these um, individual concepts in turn. So why don't we actually talk about roots and root systems? So roots, as we know, are usually hidden underground. Um, and the purpose of a root is to absorb water and nutrients and oxygen that are in the soil and pull this up into the plant. The other thing that roots do is they anchor and support the plant. So particularly when it's in a young state, we want to make sure that it doesn't get too uh, buffered by winds, etc., because that will then damage the stems on it. Um, you know, some plants actually um, have roots above the ground, though, and I think it's quite uh, interesting to chat with pupils to get them to think about what type of um, plants have roots above the ground. Um, one of them, for example, is corn. And what happens is that um, this, uh, the aerial roots, as they're called, um, because they're above the ground rather than below the ground, are help to anchor the plant as well. So we can do some investigation with pupils about um, what, uh, what roots have uh, got. Are they all below the ground? Are they above ground? And if they're above ground, what impact does that actually have? Um, how do these systems work? Well, they, on the actual root itself, there's little tiny hairs, and that sucks up water and nutrients to the centre of the root, and that's sucked up through something called a cortex. And again, it's quite good to look at the biology of um, the root systems and get the pupils to think about these new words that maybe um, sort of like I can, they can use um, in, in my various lessons. Um, and as the water is uh, sucked up through there and the nutrients sucked up through to the centre, it's then distributed through the plant uh, or it's contained and stored for later on. So if the plant doesn't need that nutrition or water at that point in time, it's stored within the root system and then it can be called upon later on. Um, we talked last month about um, so like, uh, the idea of uh, being able to see root systems and uh, I think it was Donald that's shown you um, the uh, a glass experiment where you can get visibility of what um, roots are doing below the ground. I think it's good to revisit that at this stage so children can see what the roots are doing. Um, and you can do that uh, either in a, a glass jar or even in a CD case, depending on if you're of a certain age and you remember CDs, um, that uh, you can be planting a, a seed in some soil and then just having it in a warm area, you can see this, the uh, roots develop at the same time as the plants are developing. So it's a good idea to sort of continue that concept. Um, what I want to do now is I want to talk about two types of different roots. One are fibrous roots and one are tart, one is tart roots. So hopefully you'll see a picture there, um, which has um, got uh, very colourful carrots on the right hand side. 
and um, beans on the left hand side. So um, the left hand side is really looking at the fibrous um, method of um, roots. And so this is the whole idea about them being anchored in the ground. The roots are really quite tall compared to the size of the plant above it. And so it's demonstrating the, the search that they've got for water and nutrition and so on. Um, another good way of actually, another good way of actually getting the um, uh, the system and the pupils to get visibility of uh, root systems is to um, take uh, them by pulling up some weeds. So if you were to go into the garden, pull out some weeds. It allows them to start thinking about what the idea is of the amount of space that um, roots are taking up from the, the ground. They can measure the amount of um, soil that's been taken up with it. Uh, but they can also look at the structure and the root pattern and see and compare the um, size of the plant above the ground compared to what's happening below the ground. Uh, plus, it also means that you get them to do some weeding in an educational style, which if only I could get lots of my volunteers to do that, I'd be delighted to, to continue to do that process. And on the right, what we've got is we've got an example of a taproot. Um, and um, taproots, um, when they're edible, are known as root vegetables. So we're thinking things here like parsnips, carrots and so on. Um, the picture we've got here is of uh, rainbow carrots because of the different colours. And there's an opportunity again here to get the pupils to do some investigation about the history of things like carrots, because there's a folklore where um, the reason that carrots are orange is because the Dutch growers in the 1500s um, decided that they wanted to honor William of Orange and uh, to grow uh, carrots uh, in that color. Um, it's a great story, but it's not true. Um, I'm not going to tell you the truth of it because I'd like you to do some investigation with your pupils as to why um, the colours um, are actually sort of like different than that. But um, there's lots of stories that go around all types of vegetables. And so I think it's worth exploring that with your pupils. Um, I also want to touch on this stage about the fact that um, when you're looking at root vegetables, you should really be very careful about um, how you're growing them. Um, carrots in particular do very well in a sandy soil where the root system um, manages to sort of uh, get through any um, sort of lumps in soil, et cetera. And um, so if you've got wonky carrots that you've seen in uh, the shops um, or some more uh, funny ones, shall we say, uh, you may have seen them in videos. Um, the reason about that is that um, uh, it's not got the sand I'm going through so that it can't develop the particles. So I decided I was going to do a demonstration of people to say how big a carrot could I grow. So I went and got soil, I went and got lots of sand, I mixed it through, I got a very, very deep bag that I could grow my wonderful carrots in, sowed the, sowed the seeds, and they were looking fantastic on top, and we had lots of green growth, and so the time was coming to pull them up, and I pulled them up, and instead of being long, long carrots, they were very, very short, small, stubby ones, and it's because I'd planted chanterelle carrots, which only grow to about two centimetres. So the key thing is that always read the pack and but also um, just get um, the pupils thinking about the fact that a carrot is a carrot is a carrot. So there's lots of different things you can do with it. So lots of opportunities for you to develop um, uh, stories and educational points with the pupils on that. Um, okay, I want to talk about water because water is really the immediate source of nourishment to the plant. Um, Again, we can you can use the ideas here to look at some biology um, lessons. Um, for example, water is one of the raw materials that helps to create chemical reactions for plants in order to survive. Um, so if we look at something like photosynthesis, for example, it's a process by which plants use water, but they also use sunlight and carbon dioxide to create oxygen and energy. And that energy is often stored as glucose. So you can develop this concept through planting and uh, growing to look at biology um, uh, items with your pupils. Um, the other thing as well is um, we can talk about things like transpiration. So transpiration is really how a plant manages to um, cope with changes in uh, temperature and the fluctuations within there. So if it's too hot um, and if it's got too much water, it'll lose water through its leaves to help it protect its plant. So it's kind of a bit like um, 
perspiration for us, and um, where if we're too hot, then we can perspire, uh, basically just our, our core temperatures. The same thing happens within plants, but through a process called transpiration. And again, you can talk to the pupils about that. Other things we can get the pupils to do is to actually touch the plants to see where the water is stored, because sometimes it'll be inside the leaves. It could be sitting on petals, could be in the stem, could be in the surface. So there's lots of different opportunities we've got with that. The other thing that you can do is um, you can actually um, compare the impact of water would have if you left um, vegetables in, in water. So um, leaving, say, beans overnight and carrots overnight in water, what will the impact be? You would like to think that one will get soggy and one won't, um, uh, but you can explore that with pupils as to why the structures of these are different and why does the water hopefully then run off the carrot but is absorbed through the skin of the bean. Um, one other idea um, for uh, some learning opportunities here is um, if you were to take, say, carnations, white carnations, and you were to put um, a white carnation in a, a um, bowl of water, and one bowl of water you could put in red dye and one with blue dye, um, over the course of a day or slightly more, you'll start to see that um, the petals of the white carnation will start to tinge with blue or red because it's taking the water and pulling that up. And through the plant. So again, this is something you can discuss with the pupils, how the water moves through the plants. Okay. Um, okay, we're going to talk about sharing physical space here. So um, all plants need physical space in order to get the benefit of um, the proper amount of light and nutrients and water and soil to thrive. Now, um, at the start of our garden school programme, we have a section, um, module ABC, which is all about garden design. Um, if you've already done that with the pupils, you can actually go back and revisit it. But if you haven't, it's not a problem. What we can do is you can go and have a look at the module, but look at developing a growing plan with the pupils about what they should plant and where they should plant it. I realise that some of you will have different types of um, uh, space within your schools, and we'll have different setups as far as gardens are concerned. Um, this photograph that we're uh, showing here is of a vertical wall. Now, Aberdeen City Council's Eco Group um, developed a, a program called Edible Green Walls, and this was the, what they used. It is essentially plastic bottles um, that are um, pulled together and filled with soil and then put in with different plants. But um, I've been, what we'll do is we will send the link out um, in uh, the uh, modules or we will add it into the uh, YouTube channel videos and um, so you can uh, get direct access to that. Um, it was quite interesting because again it allows you because it's clear to see root system development but also it's quite good to just let the pupils plant whatever they want in it because it demonstrates whether you can really have a carrot or a strawberry or a pea or a pumpkin growing in something that size it kind of puts it into a practical um, uh, consideration for them. The other way of doing it, if you limit the space, is to do something called square foot gardening. Um, if you've got very, very limited space, but you still want the pupils to get quite a lot of different crops. So why don't we look at that now? So square foot gardening um, uh, was developed in the US and it maximizes the amount of crops that you can grow in a small space. In this case, um, this is a programme that we did at Woodside Primary, and it has a one metre square planter, so three by three, and it was divided into squares. So there is basically one foot square in the planter, so there's nine different squares. And we let the pupils um, decide what they were going to grow in it. Um, it's amazing the amount of stuff that is grown in this one. So you'll see in the centre there are peas, and on the right hand side there are some carrots. Uh, we've got chard on the left and the little red leafed one down in the bottom uh, right hand corner is, a, is the remnants of some strawberries. There's a couple of mints in there, there's lettuce. Uh, the yellow um, leaves, the stalks that are at the top of the, of the picture look like uh, some broccoli that's actually bolted. Um, there's an awful lot of happening and it's very, very small amount of space. Um, it was so successful because it was very, very nutritious and fresh produce that we put into it. Um, but it also allows the pupils to look at the idea of what they can what they can grow together, but how much um, they can grow within a small space. And so it's up to yourselves to work with the pupils to see 
okay, if we've only got one square foot, so 12 inches by 12 inches, how many seeds can we plant in there and how many things can we grow? But one of the big questions I would say from this is that um, you have to think about all the plants that we're planting be competing for the same nutrients from the soil or can they work together to help each other? And this is a process called companion planting. So why don't we have a look at that just now? So companion planting is the idea that you can grow plants together. So this is a polyculture um, in a bed rather than on its own, uh, which is monoculture. So poly uh, Greek for many, mono Greek for alone. Um, most things in farmers, for example, will grow a lot of things in a monocultural um, process. But what are the benefits of growing together? Well, you can create the right conditions for your plants. So you can have tall plants providing shade for smaller ones that may not want so much um, uh, heat, for example. You can encourage natural insect predators and you can reduce the growth of weeds. You can see by reading there the various benefits that there are of it. Also uses a lot of soil fertility as uh, different plants need um, different uh, nutrients. And so it's well worthwhile investigating which plants work together and which ones don't. Um, we, there's a program, there's, a, there's an item called um, Three Sisters in the US, and in, we did it the last year in Scotland, so it's a Scottish version of the Three Sisters. And what we did is we grew sweet corn, we grew peas, and we grew oranges. So the peas grow up the sweet corn, and the um, squashes um, act as a ground cover, so they suppress the weeds, so they don't actually make it too warm. So the three plants kind of work together. And I think that's a good thing to think about with pupils is how they can work together. So can they actually, you could do maybe some drama out of by thinking about this is what pupils can do together as opposed to um, doing separately. Another idea about companion planting too is that you can maximise the use of space and time. So you, what you can do is you can grow crops one after the other so that, for example, we've said here, uh, if you've got potatoes, you can then plant onions once you've lifted them. If you plant some radishes, which are quite fast growing, then you can plant some squash into the same areas. It's taken out different nutritional points on it. And I've just got some ideas here about some teaching activities for companion planting. I'll be very quick now, just a couple of minutes. So it's always a good idea to, have a, to try and source a companion planting chart that's applicable for your country. There's lots of them um, that are out there. And um, they will sort of uh, show you which plants work well together and which ones don't. Often vegetables and flowers will be very complementary because the flowers will attract pollinators, which are good for the vegetables, but they'll also maybe attract some aphids, some caterpillars. So, so the vegetables that you want to end up eating will basically be able to um, uh, grow because of the fact that they've got other flowers beside them. And again, what you can do is with the pupils, you can talk about what helping each other means. And uh, we've already sort of said about the tall plant, for example. And again, using maths um, in a, in to calculate how much you can put into a small space. Um, you can probably plant 20 odd radishes in the space of one broccoli plant. So again, it's a nice conversation to have with your pupils about that. As well, if you start to look at a bit more examining about things like monoculture, um, you could start to look at how farms and larger scale agriculture grows crops and if they use companion planting or not. And is this a good thing or a bad thing for the planet? Um, we are partners in the Countryside Classroom. Again, we'll give you a link uh, later on to that. But they've got um, fantastic resources for teachers on a wide range of food and farming subjects and particularly in agriculture. So I would recommend that you go to that. Um, we are uh, really lucky to be part of that. And uh, there's lots of great resources in there. And you can also do things like investigating what insects come into the garden. So why don't you get the pupils out for, uh, for half an hour and um, they can count how many insects they've got and the different types of insects they've got. Right, very briefly, um, plant care routines. So once we've actually got the plants um, and seedlings in the ground, it's important that they're kept weed free and they're kept watered. And so you should try and develop a program of maintenance with that. You can have the pupils responsible for their own square foot, but that kind of maybe doesn't really work in a teamwork type thing. You could have a wee bit of competition of that. Um, but um, the other thing as well is that children love to water. So um, you could have that as a reward activity or a shared activity between them. Um, I would recommend that you check out whether water is needed. Um, the times that I went in when I was told by pupils that 
Bob said that she should water Monday, Wednesday, and they forgot about the fact that it rained Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. We still wanted to water, um, because there's a little bit of an issue with some plants. So um always sort of like look at how much water they need. And again, engage with the local community so that um, when plants are going during the school holidays, that you've got somebody who's able to look after them. Okay, so really that's um, all I want to say about planting and growing. Um, uh, we have a programme which um, uh, you can access through our garden school website, which has lots of different modules onto that as well. Um, I will pass over to Donald to see if um, he has anything that he wants to add or not to this section. And I'll stop sharing. Great, thanks, Bob. Um, I don't have anything uh, significant to add, except that I would say that um, you mentioned touch in uh, in one of the slides, and and that's one of the things I'd like to encourage uh, teachers to do with uh, their garden activities is to use all their senses: touch, taste, sight, sound, smell, taste, all these things, because it's important to get the sensory activities in there and helps to stimulate a little bit of conversation and so on. But uh, uh, conscious time moving on, so we'll pass over to Laura and Amy and Jonathan to talk about what they've been doing at Grace Mount School. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming along. Um, so my name's Amy Crump. I'm a teacher of home economics at Grace Mount High School. Um, I previously worked with Laura um, last year um, to do like a data collection project with existing S2 gardeners and based on like people feedback and how we felt the project went we decided we decided for this year with our new S1s um, to really make it more pupil led and really as Donald just said really explore all of their senses when they're taking part in activities within the garden so it's supposed to be pupil led sensory exploration and really building on their agency and so they're able to take responsibility within the garden and maybe think of a project they can complete within the garden. So we've got several projects kind of on the go at the moment, which I'll talk about more as we go through the PowerPoint um, and really have meaningful discussions about climate change, um, climate action as well. And a lot of the pupils, pupils for S1s that actually really articulate about um, their concerns about climate change and the future and how we can be more sustainable as well. And then finally, to kind of conclude our S1 project, we were going to, well, we are um, going to put on like a little plant or bake sale, which we just started potting on these little seedlings and we're making, you know, having these um, ideas for recipes for our bake sale as well. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, so we are we are privileged that uh, in Grace Mount High School there is an existing garden space and it is uh, actually quite large and it's, it's set aside um, on the kind of right hand side of the school as you get into through to the front entrance and it is protected, sheltered by a very tall hedge. So actually, when you go in there, it's a kind of interesting space it seems to be um yeah quite quite different from from how the the school grounds feel um just just in the front area so as amy said we're working with a small group which is an elective gardening group uh s1 pupils um and jonathan and i were both work in the university and uh, we are in a role of university teachers, researchers in a way, so collaborating with Amy in looking at what this garden space can do and how it can motivate the kids and whether it offers something to them that perhaps um, kind of normal curriculum or sort of more standardised um, teaching would kind of normally offer. We call this um, a STEAM lab. People might not know what the word STEAM means in kind of everyday language is just a, an assemblage of subject, science, technology, engineering, arts, mathematics. Uh, but um, in this particular case, what we really want to do is to draw upon the potential of this, this different disciplines when they're integrated, a bit like what Bob was saying. It's about the carrots and the history of the carrots, but it's also about the science and how it grows. And it is also about how customs and traditions and how we cook it, what we kind of understand uh, of food and and so on. So it's a kind of um, inter and transdisciplinary space. 
Um, and particularly, like Amy said as well, what we're really concerned here is not so much uh, the teaching of the growing, but um, encourage children to participate and uh, look after themselves and, and um, you know, feel well and included at school. Uh, I will now pass on to Jonathan, I think. <laughs> Yeah, these are just just uh, some examples of the sensory activities that we started off in, in the garden space as a touch, uh, just picking up on what Donald was saying, touching the soil, not just using it as a resource, but actually understanding it as a, as a living thing, touching the seeds, feeling them in the, in the hand as potential again for growth and for life, and then taking care of one's own planter. You see here on the left, the plant, that's been decorated with the soil. Um, it, it clearly belongs to somebody. You can tell that uh, there, there's a touch of, of the kids there. OK. <laughs> Thanks, Lara. Um, yeah, so the garden space is, is really important to the group, but so too is the home economics classroom. And we've been doing some, some baking and cooking there, which is something they really enjoy. They enjoy that process. They enjoy tasting as well. Um, so that's really important for them. What we've done is we've done some uh, baking inspired by the garden. So here they're baking some bread um, models of the things that they planted in the planters. So there's some lettuce and some kale and things like that. Um, and Amy was really encouraging them to think about the time it takes to sort of prepare and, and cook and bake the bread and also the time it takes to tend to and grow the garden. So making those kind of connections uh, between the two spaces. We are hoping to actually cook with some ingredients from the garden. In fact, tomorrow, that's the plan. So we're going to take some sage leaves that they've grown in one of the planters, um, take some parsley as well, maybe um, make a little salad or something like that. So we're further developing these, these connections and building on those sensory experiences as well to kind of engage their curiosity and their, and their interest, because through these activities, they ask a lot of questions um, related to the garden. Yeah, and we haven't um, cooked with ingredients from the garden yet, but what we have done is use different materials from the garden. So there was a picture before of, of one of the pupils touching the soil with their hands. And what we actually did was go and collect soil from different areas of the garden. So some in the planters, some beside the tree, some at the bottom of the hill. And then we did some soil painting uh, with them. So um, they used some glue and mixed it together to make these these different art pieces. So um, it was really interesting to see how they noticed the different texture of the soil, the different marks that the soil could make, um, the different colours and textures they could create with it. And that started conversations about why soil from different areas has different textures and what that does mean for growing and, and planting in the garden. Um, and also the artworks they created themselves. I mean, the, the eye is, is really interesting. Uh, several of them were drawing eyes uh, with the soil. And it started some conversations about observation and observing the changes in the garden. And what does it mean to observe? Do we just observe with our eyes or do we observe with, with our other senses as well? So it was a really nice activity for them to express themselves in, in a different way and also create some really nice conversations between the group too. So, yeah, I mean, the artistic activities are, are really helpful in terms of being inclusive. It's it's really nice that some of the pupils that are really interested in art can uh, connect in that way. Um, I mean, particularly some that, you know, at certain points, maybe in the traditional form of participation, maybe they don't like that look like they're fully participating in, in the planting or the weeding, perhaps. But you can see from the different drawings and artworks they're creating that they are connecting to the garden in, in a different way. Um, I think that's really important to to acknowledge that, that it is a meaningful space for them, but they maybe express it in, in different ways at, at different times. Yeah, um, and, and this is just a, also an example continuing on the theme of the sensory explorations and the observations. On the left, you'll see when we started on about September, October last year, it was a plan of uh, what we were going to plant in the gardens, what, what, what we might want to do in there. 
Um, we asked them to take pictures with their iPads just to see how the space also was changing over time. And then you'll see on the right, March 24, a plan that looks a bit like the one that we made in October. But actually, uh, it's a sort of map of the things that we have done, like the things that have been planted, uh, and things that are yet to be done, because actually this garden space is in transformation. It's quite different from what it was before. So this was almost like the map in March 2024 was supposed to way to sort of reflect what we have sort of achieved and uh, and the things that they're still wanting to do. So this was actually a collective map. Everybody was sitting around the table and contributing ideas. Um, Amy, do you want to add anything about this at all? No, just to, yeah, just to add, thank you, Lara. Um, I, th I think it was always really, we've tried like many different methods for them to get to record um, their thoughts and their opinions on the garden and having these little snapshots in time um, really shown the impact they've made on the garden throughout the, you know, since they started in August, essentially, they've like chipped away at little elements of the garden. And I think just this way of recording it as we've gone through has kind of highlighted that to them and the space they're able to ma manipulate and make an impact on, definitely. Yeah. And it's just good, especially in the March 24 um, poster that we made, just to get a sense of what they've achieved. And then this is what we're going to do on top of this to kind of conclude the project almost for this year and potentially what we can do next year if the group is running again. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit more about this transformative space, isn't yeah, it? That was, <laughs> that was all keyed up for me, thank you. Um, so yeah. the, the photo on the left is kind of how the garden looked just towards the end of summer, just as autumn was knocking on our on our doors. Um, so it was lovely bright colours and the kids were kind of taken aback by it and they're, they're like, oh, this is our space, what can we do? And then straight away they found that, like different zones within the garden that they could kind of naturally go to, they feel safe, they feel like they're find it really interesting, um, even just a safe space and to go and have lunch during lunchtime. And they realise that this garden is open you know, all, all the time they're at school. And it's not only just limited to the time they have their gardening you know, for two periods a week. Um, and that also led to them having more ideas about what they can do during the gardening lessons, okay? And then, so the picture on the right, it kind of look, it looks a bit derelict, but that was kind of um, in the new year, so in the midst of winter, and they were cutting down all the weeds, the, the bracken, the branches that were dying, and they really transformed that space. Um, this little circle is actually like a, a sculpture garden. It's got um, a couple of stone um, kind of you know, sculptures, for a better word, with little inscriptions and little poems in them. And they've really taken to that space and just yeah, seen the difference between the two pictures, not just because it's a change of season, but they've like, lifted tons of dirt, got stuck in with spades, shovels, and really seen it as a space they can change and make an impact on uh, in a meaningful way, not just like killing plants for the sake of it, but uh, getting rid of the weeds um, so they can actually grow more items and maybe put a little bench in the center and have it just a nice kind of meditative space as well. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so Jonathan and I were drawn into it. Jonathan, you want to say something about the day that it got scratched and things? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's amazing to see how it's changed. I just, I think it's really nice the way they're they're thinking about reimagining the space now, as as Amy said. But yeah, no, it's it's been great. Yeah, this is, they're very keen on 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 making the space their their own and uh, accessible and um, hospitable is their favourite spot, and they they just cleared it all out and um, made it so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just to add to that, I did find it quite strange because my first year running the gardening club that they did take more interest at chopping things down <laughs> rather than planting new stuff. Like we'd show them the planters we planted all these like wildflowers. Um, carrots and onions and they're like no nah, we want a weed we want to cut these down <laughs> yeah, but it needed yeah <laughs> they're getting hands on in that way I think and yeah. I think they liked creating as you said creating a space that they could then shape themselves I think is maybe part of part of the attraction to it so yeah um, yeah, but just just to say about that, I mean that as they were weeding this area, they it was being revealed, although they knew already that there is quite a lot of 
litter uh, in the garden. The, the, the tools that they're using are a little bit old, a little bit rusty. Um, and uh, that was starting conversations about wanting to have a bin, for example. Um, but there are also challenges around that in terms of the garden being a space that's owned by the, the local council. And so if there's a bin there, then um, it maybe won't get emptied. So there are different challenges there and different conversations that are linked to the local community, the school community, the wider community that they're that they're having right now. Uh, I mean, they're, they're coming up with their own solutions to different things. They're talking about having not only having a bin there, but having a rotor um, to do that uh, in terms of the tools as well. They've spoken a bit about how other elective groups, maybe more traditional subjects like science, have more resources or seem to be more popular, but they have been talking about not their own group being exclusive. They said, well, why don't we um, collaborate with the science group and we can do science experiments in the garden and things like that. So they're looking about how they can raise awareness of the work they're doing. And hopefully, as Amy and Lara are saying, the kind of documenting and capturing that they've been doing is the way that they can raise uh, awareness of some of these issues in the school and in, in the community as well. Yeah, and that's, this is our kind of um, uh, little point in time after all this work and um, kind of building our relationships, the working to, working together in the garden, sharing food in the home economic space, planning together, sharing stories. Uh, we now want to actually bring other people into this, and these are the parents. So what you see here are uh, little invitations that um, the kids have started to make to invite the parents to come in um, in a few weeks' time to help out with doing some of the, the things that uh, perhaps they are not able to do in the garden. As Jonathan mentioned, those heavy tools are okay to handle for a while, but it's, um, you know, it could do with a pair of stronger arms. Uh, and it's also a way to sort of partake with the parents, the pleasure and the, the, of the work that they have done. Um, so again, here you see you see them, you recognize the clouds that were painted in soil in some of the earlier slides, but you also recognize the GHS, the Graceman High School logo, appearing on this beautiful drawing of one of our artist kids in, in the group. Uh, I don't know, Amy, Jonathan, if you want to add anything here, Pete. It did, yeah, it did take a while for them to uh, to work up the, I will not say courage, but they're a bit hesitant to get the parents involved. Like, no, my parents will say no, they don't want to come. But like uh, teasing them, uh, teasing the answers out of them and thinking, no, your parents will actually be really proud of what you've done. And it's a space for everyone in this community. And we do need a strong pair of hands, like Lara said. There's a lot of heavy lifting still to be done. Um, but they kind of warmed up to the idea as more of, a, again, like a celebration of what they've done, what they've achieved. And if enough people get involved, you know, the results pay off, essentially. Yeah. Yeah, abs absolutely. And I think, I mean, a bit like the, the presentation here, it's been a great conversation that we've had and how we've collaborated, you know, with Amy. It's been fantastic. And it's really nice to see that, the conversations are now going beyond the group and reaching um, the, the local community and reaching their parents. And it's it's right, they're a bit hesitant at first, but now they've seen we've got several parents that have agreed to come and help out. Um, uh, yeah, we've tempted them with, tempted them with coffee and, uh, and biscuits, but it's great. And it's gonna be a really nice moment, I think, to share that with their, with their families, all the work that they've done. Yeah. And I think this is us for now, isn't it? We will keep you updated on how things go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to kind of have a wee chat about things. <laughs> OK. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> Donald, is there anything you would like to add or Bob? No, so, uh, I mean, I, I have had the privilege of being into Grace Mount a couple of times to participate with the class and doing things. In fact, I was there just a couple of weeks ago when they were uh, had the secateurs out and getting rid of all these thorny plants and things. That was quite an experience. It was uh, interesting. Um, and I'm hoping to be able to visit as well um, in future. So uh, it's, a, it's a great project and it's, it's always interesting to get feedback from Laura when, when she's been there. Great. 
Awesome. I, I just wanted to uh, thank you all very much for amazing input uh, tonight. I also am aware that because we are recording, the those who will watch us in the future won't see the chat. So I'm just going to quickly read out the question in the chat and the answer just for those who were keen, because I have uh, several teachers that email me and say they couldn't manage, but they would love to see them uh, watch the recording. So I'm just going to quickly scoot through this. So Ms. McLennan asked in the chat, asked Amy the following question, is your gardening time built into the curriculum or do you do it as an extra? And also how long is your project for and do you work cross curricular? So Amy helpfully typed her message, uh, answer in the chat, which I'll also read. So um, our gardening is an elective for one year and only runs if uh, there are pupil numbers. We find it attracts more vulnerable pupils in general and typically runs most years if there is one of our HFT teachers that can take it. We're trying to develop cross-curricular links. So hopefully that's useful, not just for uh, Ms. McLennan, but for anyone listening uh, to the recording later on. I just have one final thing that I'd like to share with you, and it is actually an evaluation link that I always share. And it's just a quick um, set of questions to let us know how you're finding the, the sessions, if they're relevant for your classrooms, and um, hopefully the questions themselves are relevant and lend themselves to what you were coming here to, to hear about. So hopefully that matches your expectation. And um, I would also like to say that we're in the middle of um, Climate Week Northeast, which is a set of events that's run by Nescan Hub, and we're part of um, our contribution to the, the, the Climate Week Northeast is a set of half hour lunchtime sessions that we're in the middle of because it's Wednesday today so you sort of this was uh, the cultivating education part three sits nicely in that uh, conversation about climate this week in particular and um, so if you'd like to check out our event right there are some other um but potentially interesting topics that we're talking about and they're in sort of half hour slots during lunchtime so that's i think all from us unless anybody has any questions or anybody would like to add anything we would love to hear from you otherwise i think we saved ourselves 10 minutes which is amazing yeah. <laughs> i have a question yeah, yeah. Uh, a question to miss mclennan uh, i don't know whether she writes from a primary school secondary school or local authority um so just uh want to know the reason for her question uh, with respect to interdisciplinary work and so on. I don't know if she's connected. Yes, I am connected. Oh, Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, uh, we have <laughs> uh, we've got a, a relatively new school. It's only five years old, so it's not. It's it's got one of the little polycrubs. You know the polycrub. Have you heard of them? So we've got a little one, nobody really works with it. And being a home ec teacher as well, that's why I was asking Amy how she did this. Um, mm -hmm. I have decided that I will take this on. Um, but like yourself, I don't have a lot of time. It's a secondary school. Um, I probably have about uh, one free period a week to do this in. So when Amy said about the um, how they were doing it in their school, I wondered about the, the project time because it was a project and I was thinking, is it just a one year thing or is it just a term thing? Um, so yeah, it's trying to get a grip on how many kids I can take at a time to make it a valuable exercise. And I'm thinking it's not that many in numbers. How many do you take, Amy? Yeah, we have eight. Um, and as you replied to a message, like we're capped at 20, as you, as you know, in HFC and home economics, um, we're really lucky we got away with just having eight pupils. Usually a cast would be dropped, uh, like an elective would be dropped and they'd be merged with another one. Um, but I'd say any more than 10, it'd be quite tricky, especially in terms of safety with using yeah. equipment and things like that. Um, but I feel for you, only having one period, one period a week to plan. We were at first thinking of getting them an NPA or something like that and actually getting a qualification out of it. But it's just, it needs to be pupil led, this kind of project, what they want out of it without having to get loads of coursework for them to complete because they probably won't engage very well with that. Oh, she's frozen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And um, next question, I think, is coming from David Innes. 
It was really to follow up that uh, that point as well to say that the, I think the the example from last month's talk from Bangor Academy is quite an interesting one to go into as well, both for the for both the speakers they are one one of the um, the group and how you involve the group in different sorts of ways and I think so for the Miss McLennan um, question that would be relevant and then the 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 National Progression Award I think the last last month's one it was it was the horticulture. Uh, national, national four, national five, one of those awards that was spoken about in that one. And again, whether you'd want to go all the way down that route or whether you at least could draw some bits from those course descriptors might be quite interesting, at least to get people partial credits towards some of that, some who are spending more time in it and things like that. And then I think there's also areas like the Saltire Awards and the, the sort of spending time in those sorts of things. So I think any of those would be great. And my other observation around it was how how both those presentations last month and this one were very much in the space of well-being um, and the therapeutic values of it. And I was, I was speaking to a parent today whose youngster was really having difficulty settling with the main sort of just, you know, a, a fourth year lad who's really just struggling to get through a day. And again, it's unfortunate that he is not in a school where they've got something like this, that at least for a bit of time, they could get some peaceful time, peaceful headspace to then manage the rest of their school week around that. So it's just that I think there's probably big learning points from those two sessions about well-being, wellness and, and those sorts of things. I've, I've drawn that out from both the presentations. Really, really appreciate that, folks, for what you're doing. David, in response also to to your observation and in addition to your observation, something that we also noticed um, when we go in the in the Grace Mount High School surrounding communities, the fact there's a lot of new housing being built. It's actually expanding, growing um, quite large and taking over the earlier sort of farmland that was there. So there's a lot of new people, there's a big influx of families, but there isn't a lot of spaces, like free spaces for young people to socialise. Yes, they can go to the gym if they have a gym membership, they can go to the swimming pool. They might go to the library if their parents encourage them to go there, but it's not everybody's taste or everybody's habit. So actually when they see, when you see children socialising or somehow finding a space in a school, to do that on, on, on their own term is quite interesting. Um, they might do it in pairs, they might not be fully as a group. There are the usual dynamics, um, competition, cooperation that is set there established, but that's part very much of social life. And it's different than just sitting down and preparing for a qualification. It's a, you know, it's a space that attends to different educational needs. So I was just kind of yeah reflecting on 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 that. It seems like that that garden space is almost like a little um, expansion of time that perhaps children do not normally get. Yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of just to, uh, sorry, just to add to that. It's kind of free from any kind of structure. I think Lara, you made this point a couple of weeks ago. Like the the body language changes as soon as the bell goes. Lunchtime, the, the, the lunchtime they're out. The bags are on and they're they kind of revert back to okay quite stressed quite anxious but the the gardens just like the more free and it's a definitely more supports their well-being it's a safe space for them yeah and I, I was just going to come back Laura and say that um, I'm a secondary head teacher before retiring and uh, it, it was sometimes the straight A's kids it was sometimes the kids who had three advanced hires would pick would, they would pick cake decorating as well alongside it and the cake decorating was a, a peaceful place where they could just free their heads for all the other stuff. So it's it serves a need for different people at different times in their lives. And um, no, it's really good what you're doing. Thank you. OK, great. Any other questions? Observations? Hopefully you were also clicking on the link I posted and uh, sort of listening and filling in the, the form at the same time to let us know how we're getting on. And um, I'll give you another 10 seconds to offer a question or a comment. But other than that, thank you so much for logging on tonight and for all of the ones who've been to the other two sessions. We're going into the next session 
and we're going to have I've written down the guest speakers for our next session. We're going to have Bob and Donald, of course, and um, I'll be there, but we're really looking forward to welcoming Runa Moet, Moet and Lindsay McBride from OIN. So that's going to be an interesting uh, conversation as well to see how they've been getting on. So hopefully we'll see you next time. And also um, I will be sending the recording of this to everybody that's registered, not just the people that attended. Thank you very much for tonight. Thank you. 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 See you tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks. Bye, Jonathan. So we can stop the recording, I think. Sorry, just about to do that. Uh, yeah. Record and transcribe. Let's go on. Stop recording. There we go.